I want to recognize uh, our official airline sponsor for the ASES Symposium, Southwest Airlines. They've been a great supporter. They've been a great supporter, a longtime supporter for ASER, uh, and we are so appreciative uh, for their support and their sponsorship, um, which has been, uh, which has helped ASER to be able to uh, conduct a lot of our business, including a lot of our travel business. They have a very special message for all the attendees, and I'm going to read it to you here. Uh, everyone, please take a moment to look under your chair and see if you got a voucher under you. And, and not everyone has one, there's only a select few. But if you happen to have a Southwest voucher chair under your chair, guess what? You just got a $100 voucher from Southwest Airlines. Take a look, and I know, yeah, there may be some empty seats, oh, yeah. That's why I said you snooze, you lose. You better take a look. Take a look. Not everyone has it, only a select few, but I see some that were waving them. They look just like this. They look just like this. Yes, that is also, you never know, we have some surprises for people that come back. So the ones that left, sorry. You know, so, so great, great, great. All right. So now, uh, uh, now on to our program. So to, uh, to start our Chief Diversity Officer program, I'd like to welcome uh, one of our ASED members of the Board of Directors, she is the Executive Director of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C. Please give a big warm welcome to Marianne Gomez. Buenos dias. I'm still smiling because no matter what our education level is, how high we are on that ladder, we love our coupons. <laughs> So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the moderator who is going to guide us through the next session. Um, as Sid said, um, I'm with the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Uh, we are one of the 16 coalition members of the organization and so very happy and proud to be here and to be part of this um, symposium. In this panel, we have a group of chief diversity officers from major US corporations, including Mass Mutual, Kraft, McDonald's, GM, and Clorox. Serving as a moderator for today's discussion is Dr. Robert Rodriguez. So let me say a few uh, words about him before we have him and the rest of the panel um, join us on stage. Dr. Robert Rodriguez is the president of DRR Advisors, LLC, a boutique diversity consulting firm. Many consider Dr. Rodriguez a leading expert on Latino talent initiatives based on his work with close to 200 corporations. I think it's actually probably more than that. He has helped them advance their Latino talent agendas. He is the author of the book, Latino Talent, Effective Strategies to Recruit, Retain, and Develop Hispanic Professionals. It has provided a valuable framework for corporations looking to increase the impact of their Latino talent efforts. He is a Latino Leadership Institute graduate from UCLA and a faculty member for University of Southern California's Latina Leadership Academy. He was also featured, um, he's also a featured, excuse me, columnist for Diversity Executive Magazine and has published over 75 diversity related articles and white papers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodriguez to moderate our session. I'll take a seat here. We'll keep this informal. Thank you very much, Marianne, for the introduction and Sid for the, the opportunity. Very, very excited to, to be here with all of you today. You know, myself and, and the panelists, we had a great discussion before we uh, got all mic'd up and everything. And, and we, 
basically made a commitment that said, we really want this to be more of a conversation, more of a dialogue, right? We're not up here to pontificate, we're not up here to, uh, to lecture, uh, but what we really want to do is provide a, a forum for us to maybe take a sneak peek behind the curtain a little bit. What, what does this chief diversity officer, diversity executive role look like within corporate America? What are some of the things that uh, help them be successful? Maybe some of the things they're looking to do uh, a little bit more effectively. Uh, and maybe if we can find out a little bit more about them personally. So if you don't know them, again, we have Irby here from Clorox, Ken from uh, G G GM, you know, Jorge, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Jorge from Kraft, uh, Lori from Mass Mutual, and Pat Harris from McDonald's. So again, why don't we give them a round of applause for joining us here today. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and yeah, I know we kind of how we're set up. You know, we have five panelists here. Pat, you seem so far away, but uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, Pat and I have shared the stage on many an occasion. Uh, I think our books came out about the same time together. We've been on videos together, book signings together. So I consider Pat a, a good friend. Uh, but probably um, one of the things that you know, when I get to mention Pat Harris the most often is I frequently am asked, Robert, when it comes to you know, Latino initiatives in corporate America, what are some of those companies that you think do it very, very well? Uh, and McDonald's is always, you know, top of mind. I, I think the work that you all do has been terrific. Uh, you help set the bar for a lot of organizations. And maybe as a good way to kind of start this panel, love to have you share a little bit about, you know, what's allowed you to have that success. You know, maybe tell us a little bit about the Hispanic representation you have at McDonald's and kind of what helped you get to that level of representation. Okay, yeah. thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Well, first I want to say thanks to Sid for inviting me mm -hmm. to represent McDonald's on this panel and I bring you greetings from our CEO, Steve Easterbrook, and the 1.8 million employees at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So I will begin by answering the question in terms of the representation mm -hmm. at McDonald's, of which I am extremely proud of. Um, I believe, and I may be wrong, that we are one of very few companies that have five executives at the table, Hispanic executives mm -hmm. at the table, um, that sit with Steve Easterbrook, our CEO, once a month. And, and, and they're at the table in different capacities mm -hmm. um, throughout the organization, and I'm very proud uh, particularly of one who's here today, my boss, J.C. Gonzalez Mendez. Here's if you would mind. I saw him here, there he is. <laughs> and, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I say that because J.C. has always been one of my greatest diversity champions mm -hmm. throughout my 39 year ca mm -hmm. career at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that, that makes me proud of the fact that we have such great uh, Hispanic leadership mm -hmm. um, at the table, sitting at the table with Steve Easterbrook, is, is that they've been there for a while. This isn't something that just happened overnight. They were there with our previous CEO, Don mm -hmm. Thompson, and they're there and, and they make things happen. Our, our officers, we have 20 Hispanic officers, um, six at that level, at the senior VP level and above, and they meet periodically to talk about, you know, what's happening with Latinos within McDonald's. Okay. They meet periodically with Steve Easterbrook and other leaders within the organization. And they are a part of, and I know we're going to talk about it later, but they are a part of our Hispanic employee business mm -hmm. network. Okay. And so the fact that they're there and they are, they, they are role models to the other Latinos within the organization, we have six, seven Hispanic leaders out in our 22 regions okay. who are literally running regions, you know, from SoCal to Baltimore, Washington, you name it. And, and they too are participants um, in helping to raise the bar for Latinos sure. within sure. McDonald's. Now, but, but love to hear a little bit more, you know, because I know lots of other organizations that have a large Hispanic employee population. They're on that journey, right? They're trying to, uh, make sure that their uh, Latino leaders are, are upperly mobile and advancing within the company. But, but you have achieved that. How, how did those folks get up to some of those senior levels? Love, love to hear more about that. Well, uh, well, I think there are four things that okay. I say have made McDonald's successful over the years. And one has to do with, and we heard it yesterday, leadership commitment. We would not be where we are if we did not have 
lead, the leadership commitment that we've had over time. Mm. It did, again, it, it didn't just happen this year, it's been there for years. So leadership commitment and accountability, okay. holding the others accountable who report into them, I think is key. The second thing I believe has to do with uh, diversity education. Uh, mm. We've had diversity education since the late 70s at McDonald's. We started uh, with a workshop for everybody called Managing the Changing Workforce. And it was like we saw this tidal wave and, and our consultants at that time said, this tidal wave is coming, so you better start fixing this sure. now. So we introduced a workshop back in the day, um, I think it was 79, 78, 79, called Managing the Changing Workforce. So I think the education piece is very key. Today we have several workshops uh, for Latinos. We have Hispanic Career Development One and Hispanic Career Development Two. So we have two workshops for our Hispanic employees. We also have uh, Women's Career Development for Latinas. And that workshop has been extremely positive and so much that we are going to start teaching and facilitating that uh, oh, workshop perfect. in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And perfect. so those workshops, I think, are, are critical. Clearly, the Hispanic Employee Business Network is very important to our business. And, and the fact that the engagement of our employees is important for us because they tell us what we need to do. And they're not shy about it. They're, they're pretty vocal in terms of what's working mm -hmm. and what's not working. And I know you've participated mm -hmm. with us in helping uh, our Hispanics in many of the career development workshops, as well as some of our um, symposiums that we've ha held over the years. So yeah, I think great. those are some of the things that have helped us be successful. Okay. The, the, the third thing I would say, a fourth thing, so it's commitment, our education, our employee business mm -hmm. networks. And the fourth thing has to do with our engagement in the community. Um, started by our founder, Ray Kroc, mm -hmm. who said many, many years ago, none of us is as good as all of us. Mm -hmm. And today that continues because it's all about giving back to the customers that we serve. So our engagement in the community is very important for us and we can talk sure. about that sure. some more as well. Wonderful. You know, Jorge, I'm gonna to jump to you a little bit. One of the things that, um, Someone asked me uh, the, the other day to, to pose this question, if you will, is, is to talk about this, this chief diversity officer role, right, right. Or, or head of diversity within an organization. And someone was curious to say, where, where does the power from that role come from, right? Because you don't have a, a p &L, so how does a chief diversity officer, how do you gain that you know, responsibility, uh, authority, influence within your organization? I'll toss up to you. So, so just the fact that you said that I don't have a P&L, uh, my CEO will tell you that I do, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, the, the stock is something that is near and dear to his heart and my heart. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I wanna go back to what Pat was saying a little mm -hmm. bit before we sure. get into the power of the role, because I think it's, we influence a lot, but I think, you know, so someone like Tyrone Studemeyer, you know, a couple years ago, I was in a conference similar to this said that you gotta think about this whole diversity and inclusion thing, like making chocolate milk, right? <laughs> That in, in, I'm sure you've heard this, right? That you pour the syrup, right, and the, the milk, where does the chocolate go? Where does the syrup go? Right? And it could stay there. You can drink the milk and it'll still taste like the milk that you just poured. But if you're not purposeful in steering it, right? And I, and I would say to you that I think when, when you hear Pat talk about the strategies that they've had since 1979, diversity is by design, but inclusion is by intent. Okay, it's an action that, that, that you do. And so when you, when you pose the question as, where do we get our power from? I think we get our power from our thought leadership, right? Um, we are, by design, I think, entrepreneurs that have started with a company that have not been defined by the, the job role, by the position that we have. We've actually have developed the skill set, let's say, that has been able to expand Right, to think about what is the value proposition that our departments deliver for our organizations. Right? Yeah. What are the benefits? I, I think about that every day. What benefit do I bring to the company for the salary that I get paid? Right? If I'm meeting you know, across the table with the vendor, if I come to a conference like this, what am I taking back to provide the value for the expense for me being here at the Ritz? 
Yeah. Right. So I, I would tell you that that you know to be short and give you a quick answer. That that's it right there. Right. I, I think I've learned now over time that I'm an entrepreneur. That it's my thought leadership that allows me to be at the table and allows me to execute on the strategies that I'm challenged to to to, to work on. Does that help? Irby, would you anything to add to that? Similar at, at the Clorox company. Yeah. So I think the way that I view diversity, I think of diversity as a business. And I view myself as the general manager of diversity, and all of our employee groups are our business units. So when we look at this uh, and the, the elevating the conversation beyond just representation, that's on our corporate scorecard, and that's part of the bonus that all the executives get, is meeting those numbers. But if we start looking at the data and the buying power of Latinos, 1.5 trillion, blacks, 1.1 trillion, Asians, 750 billion, LGBT, 850 billion. When I have that conversation about market share, because we're in it to win it at Clorox, you know, 80% of our brands are number one and number two in market share, then the straight white men are all in when I talk about market share, right? Sure. If I'm talking about Smart. percentages or Hispanic Heritage Month or Black History Month, then those are really events and activities. People will come and get some food and go back to work. So I think that's been key. And also looking at the employee groups and driving them as well. Uh, the ABCs, I call them. One is advancement. How do I help people that self-identify with that group advance in the company? That's critical. What's the business connection? How do we drive growth and innovation at Clorox? And the culture piece, I think we do just fine. I think in some cases we over-index on culture, too much culture. So as an example, uh, our Latino employees bought a business, Nueva Casino. Now part of the insights are that Latino millennials are craving home-cooked meals, but they're either too busy or don't know how to make tortillas from scratch like grandma, because grandma's recipe, <laughs> she didn't write no anything one can make down. Like grandma. Yeah. yeah. And so we looked at businesses, and uh, we have food businesses, right, and, and part of our portfolio, and it's a, it's a meal packet, and you take that meal packet and you add your fresh proteins or veggies, and in 20 minutes you have a Latino meal. But we didn't just buy it, we said, okay, uh, we relaunch it in nine months, change all the packaging, because typically if you go down the ethnic aisle in your local supermarkets, uh, the Latino things are going to be mostly Mexican and mostly taco sauce. So we relaunched this brand, and now we have Peruvian, Caribbean, Cuban, uh, all types of things, rice and beans that go to that consumer, but that was driven by the employees. They recommended it. We got senior executives to take it on as an acquisition target. Uh, they are focusing as an, or we use them as an internal focus group to drive the packaging, the, the, the marketing, the whole thing. So we really view them as a business, and our employees are very competitive. So if one group does something, then the other group says, yes, I need to go buy a business. Yeah. So all of our employees are thinking about how do we drive market share for this company. But, but you know, so, so the only follow-up I'll have to that is that, you know, at, at a lot of companies I know, you know, that's, that's the, the narrative right now. Hey, business resource groups, yep. right? And they need to impact the business or else they never get the credibility and respect that they deserve. Right. But at, at many organizations, what I'm finding is that, you know, when an employee resource group doesn't impact the business, it's not their fault. You know, I see them jumping up and down saying, hey, right. you know, we're here. We want to be a focus group. Sure. We want to help with marketing. We, but it's someone in else in the organization, you know, we're good. And, and, and I think in those environments, these ERGs become an underutilized asset. Absolutely. So how were you able to turn that around at, at Clorox so that way they were, you to, they were seen as an asset that they could do these things? So part of it, it starts with who is the executive sponsor of the group. Mm, okay. uh, typically, a lot of the groups start as clubs, and they kind of, from the bottom up, and they get some funding, they do activities. Here, uh, all the executive sponsors of the groups are one of the top 15 executives. Matter of fact, the current CEO of Clorox, Ben Odor, was previously the executive sponsor for the Latino group because he was very passionate about growing uh, that business and the, and the employee base. So I went to him and said, well, you know what? You should be the sponsor of it if you're that passionate. He said, I will. And so uh, all of the employee groups have an EVP or SVP who's the executive sponsor. They're also very competitive. So if one group is doing something, how does my group? I think that's key. And then all of the leaders of the groups, we don't vote on it and Irby's the leader and next year Robert's the leader. Mm -hmm. All the leaders are vice presidents or above of the groups. Mm -hmm. and, and the key is two people are, are leading each employee group, but one of them has to come from the core of the business. So for us, the core of the business is marketing, sales, supply chain, R&D. Uh, I can't have a, a HR person and, a, and a, you know, an IT person run an employee group or a legal person because you know, that's, they don't bring the business lens every day. Mm -hmm. So we have vice presidents, general managers, all those key executives. They're deeply involved. And then the ERGs are running like business units. So just like the company has you know, business 
uh, at all levels. The ERGs have folks at all levels of the company, not just the lower level folks that have a lot of energy to do activities. Uh, you know, it's high That's level. Good. That's good. Yeah, you know, Laura, I want to you know maybe continue on a conversation we started in the kind of the green room, so to speak. You know, the, the you know you mentioned that uh, Mass Mutual made Diversity Inc. top 50. So congratulations! Have a round of applause for them. That's awesome. That's terrific. That's terrific. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that journey has been been like, and 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 what do you think kind of got you on the on the list and to receive that recognition? You know, people don't realize that. And I joined the company in 2008, um, and. Diversity was hardly a word that was uttered, mm, <laughs> you know. Right. So to go from where we were in 2008 to where we are now in 2015 to be a top 50 company for diversity has been uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of tenacity, um, but a lot of influencing our leaders. The, the good news is that ES, uh, ESPN, I almost said ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work at ESPN. Yeah. Uh, at Mass Mutual, I always say that our diversity journey started in the business because they hired the multicultural marketing people before they hired me. So like a year before I came in, they sort of understood that the market was changing and what did we have to do differently there. So when I joined the company, it was, um, you know, I had partners to work together. And when we built our diversity strategy, it was very much about the business. It's still about the business. And then uh, continuing along the lines of, of um, demonstrating value, we actually can, we can show that our increase in diversity and inclusion has resulted in sales for our company, mm -hmm. whether it's diversifying our field uh, force, our home office. Um, it's, it's increased our engagement of employees. Um, so we've had some successes. Um, but the journey has been not easy. You know, you're coming into an organization, and somebody said that the culture, you know, you're, you got the culture down. We don't, and we're still working through that. So that's a really hard thing to do. It's a 160-year-old company, a very successful company. Sometimes very successful companies are harder to, to change, sure. mm -hmm. right? Just sort of, uh, you don't have the pain points that yep. you're looking for in order to change. Um, so that culture piece is huge, so much so that this last year, in 2014, we refreshed our diversity strategy and said we really want to tackle that and leadership has become a very big piece of what we're doing moving forward, and that is making sure that our leaders are culturally competent and inclusive. We're assessing our leaders to understand where they are on that spectrum of cultural competency, and then we're helping them put a game plan together on how do they get better. But all of those things have um, helped us to continue to rise. I mean, we literally, you could see, I think we started somewhere in 2010 around 150. <laughs> You know, we yeah. looked at where were we, and we continued to progress every year, and we just kept doing uh, what we needed to do. I mean, uh, in 2008, we didn't have a supplier diversity program. Just mm -hmm. an example of where we're starting from rock bottom yeah. and building up from there. Um, and then keeping our leaders informed, bringing them to the table. Our executive team serves as and still serves as our executive diversity council, mm -hmm. um, and making sure you know, we have a company, I'm sure many of your companies are the same way. It's all about the data, where are we? Okay. And uh, where our gaps are and helping create solutions to close our gaps. So very much it's a, a labor of love mm -hmm. um, and continues to be so. Yeah. But great accomplishment. Nonetheless. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Ken, I want, uh, first I want to say, uh, you know, if you read Ken's bio, you know, he uh, spent some time in the Navy. So first I want to say thank you for your service. I'll have a round of applause for, for that. <laughs> <clears throat> but I love I love to get your perspective to see you know you know as you kind of help to oversee some of the diversity initiatives within the, the Navy, what sort of things that you learned that helped you when you made that transition to GM and corporate America? No, that's a great question, Robert. I, I think that uh, for me, you know, coming from a very large organization, you know, you're talking about the Navy is about five hundred thousand. You know, it uh, it kind of moves at a snail's pace at times. You know, so I think I was. You know, coming into corporate America thinking, hey, I'm going to General Motors now. Things are going to just happen that fast. It's not quite as quick as you might imagine, right? <laughs> so um, I think from that aspect, that's uh, certainly something that's prepared me, being in a large organization, understanding the different uh, dynamics that occur in that large organization and where you can find allies across the board. And I would just like to talk about, you know, certainly a difference for me, even though you know, when you talk about it from a standpoint of diversity as being, you know, in a military service, 
uh, being clear that we're about making sure that we represent all the citizens that we sure. serve, and then kind of moving into the market. You know, so it's about talent, but it's about markets. I think everybody's talked about the business here. And you even heard yesterday from Steve Hill, if you guys listened to him on the C-suite, he talked about customers and he talked about the business. So I tell you, every single time I have a discussion with any group, whether it's at the you know, executive leadership team level or it's any middle managers, I always bring up ethnic share of brand, what it means to the bottom line, how we're doing in this particular market, and what the delta would be is if we increased it up to our just normal share rate, what that delta is and what that brings to the bottom line. Terrific, terrific. You know, one of the things that we want to you know, do in, as part of this conversation is to talk a little bit about you know, how do you know, diversity leaders make some of the deci decisions that you do on, on a daily basis. And one of those, I'd love to get some insight as to you know, your process, and this is for any, of, any one of you who want to answer, um, but your process in determining which nonprofits, for example, you're going to support. You know, if we look at just in the Latino space alone, we have, of course, all the kind of coalition members of ACER and ACER itself, um, but all these organizations have a compelling mission and vision. Um, what process do you, any of you use to say, okay, we're going to sponsor and really support this one, this one maybe not, you know, not, is not focused on some of the things that we need? Love to have yeah. any of you kind of talk about it. Maybe yeah. Jorge, start out? Sure. You know, so we've kind of, over time, because one of the other things I should have mentioned is, is that I'm not afraid to steal shamelessly, right, from people <laughs> on the panel. Yeah. Um, when you see corporations doing some incredible things, it's easier to take edit than to create at times, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so what you've learned is, is that some of these companies have done a wonderful job of branding. So when you ask that, you know, I, I need to partner with organizations that are going to help me brand. You know, we know that we're in 98% of the pantries, you know, craft, right? Um, and so we need to make sure that those products are sustainable and are relevant through the generations that are coming, right? We just can't assume that mac and cheese will be around 30 years yep. from now. We gotta make sure that it is, right? Even so much that we'll change the formula to do that, right? Um, then we wanna make sure that we can get talent acquisition from it, okay? okay. Um, so branding, talent acquisition. The third one, which I think is really important because if you have a corporation that has a leaky bucket, right, that brings in talent in the door, but you're losing it on the back end, you need the talent development as a retention strategy. Mm -hmm. That's right. why when you do a diagnostic, so when I came into Kraft, one of the things that we did was we evaluated you know, from right to left, what were the issues that were impacting our diversity representation in the company? Right. And very quickly, we realized that it was a retention. Yep. Right? So we needed to make sure that we needed to create an inclusive environment where the quietest person in the room had a voice, mm -hmm. the person who was felt most different felt like they belonged, and the person, regardless of tenure, right, that they knew that they can still contribute. Because you can graduate with the MBA from Ross Business School, and next day, you're in charge of one of our brands. So we needed to make sure that the generational differences was going to allow that to happen. Mm. Because you didn't have to sit in different seats. You were running, you're going to be managing a P&L. So you have branding, talent acquisition, you have talent development. The other one is, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because it's kind of like a reverse, right? We wanted to make sure that we could also have a reach into the community, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And then the final one is we needed to make sure that that organization can help us make strategic relationships, partnerships, mm -hmm. that not only we can partner in business, but we can partner in the community, right? You know, with the craft, we go across, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we work with McDonald's, with Mac Cafe, right? We work with other, you know, mm -hmm. um, our food service works with other um, um, organizations. You know, you can go in and you can see the Mayo, you can see, you know, yeah. so we have to make sure that we're building those partnerships. So those five things are critical. So when we are sitting across from someone and we're asked for a sponsorship, mm -hmm. we go through the list. It may be mentally, it may be on a sheet, and we're mm -hmm. going through it. And we want to find out if they can live into that value proposition for us. Because if they can, then they get the bucks, right? Terrific. If they can't, then we have to figure out a way, a win-win, to connect sure. with them. So that, that yeah. would be a filter. So, so it sounds like you almost develop your criteria first, and then you vet the organizations against that criteria. You know, that's yeah. the fairest way, I think, okay. to, yeah. to do it, because yeah. it puts everyone on the same playing field. Terrific. So, Lori, we're going to add to that? Something similar? Yeah. Um, we actually started out where I think a lot of companies start out. We're doing a lot of things with a lot of organizations, and in fact, across the business, different areas of the business we're partnering. We didn't even know there were partnerships going on in certain areas of business. So actually, we have also created sort of a filter system 
to understand um, what is the re return on investment that this relationship will give mm -hmm. us over time. Um, whether it's access to talent, whether it's access to center of influence, uh, the ability to get to customers or to educate customers. So Alpha is probably, I will, is anybody here in the room from Alpha, but a shout out to Alpha. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but Alpha remember. is um, absolutely a, a, a great example of an organization that we've been able to leverage. Uh, we have 85 agencies across the company, uh, country. Uh, these are folks that sell our products in these various markets. And so we've been able to partner with uh, the chapters mm -hmm. in uh, various cities across the country with Alpha chapters and, and, and getting them uh, linked up with our, with our agencies out in the field. We, uh, we attend their conference every year. Um, you know, we get up on panels and speak. So from the brand perspective, it's very strong there too. But it really is looking at these organizations and we're having to put them through filter now. We did this, by the way, in partnership with the business. So the mm -hmm. idea of bringing the right people to the table. And Nicole, <laughs> Nicole Bremser is here. Mm -hmm. She actually um, heads up our diversity recruitment strategy. She went out and pulled all the decision makers together and said, we didn't even know what we were spending. That was a huge thing. What yeah. were we mm -hmm. spending across the business mm -hmm. in all of these various pockets? And what segments were we targeting? Yep. Um, and it wouldn't it be better if we were all working collaboratively mm -hmm identifying those organizations like an alpha that we mm -hmm. could truly leverage across the business and invest more there. So we, we created even a tier system. To, you know, level one yeah. is an alpha. Level two, you know, and what does yeah. that look like from, you know, how much would you be supportive uh, yeah. from a from yeah. client yeah. perspective? And, yeah. and we do yeah. similar mm -hmm. to, to Kraft and Mass Mutual mm -hmm. in, in terms of looking at organizations that we feel support our strategic initiatives. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, there was a time when all we did was bought tables, yeah. you know, another yeah. dinner, another dinner. We said no more dinners. Uh, it could be a dinner, but it needs to be some strategic initiative wrapped around that. And, and we have folks now who are looking deeper into organizations to see what they're all about. Right. You know, before it was more free just to build relationships, yep. and that's a good thing. But today, we have to be more strategic Absolutely. in looking at things like education, mm -hmm. health, and, and, and what the organizations are doing uh, in that arena sure. to make sure that it supports our goals yeah. as well. I, I like it. Yeah, do you want to yeah I mean, I, I think uh, in yesterday's panel, Steve Hill brought up uh, our engagement with the United Way and what we've done with the Detroit public school system, right? And he really talked about that, hey, we used to just give lots of money to United Way and a varied you know, array of different organizations that certainly do great things, but really trying to hold them accountable for actually making progress in that Detroit public school system is something that's critical. But we do similar things to, to McDonald's and, mm -hmm. and all my other uh, uh, panel mates here is basically looking at certain pillars that we look at and try to try to focus it, whether it's sustainability or safety or STEM education. You know, those are kind of the critical pillars, but then from there, it's about the customer and community engagement. So yeah. where we're located around the US and around the globe, how can I build those relationships with those plant cities ends up being the key determinant if we're gonna invest or sure. not. Sure, okay. but, but Irby, how do yep. you ensure that alignment? Because you know, yeah. I, you know, some of you may know, I used to work at Alpha. and, mm -hmm. and yep. We knew that some organizations, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was right. doing. So we might go to diversity and say, hey, not a right fit, that's okay. We'll just go community affairs. <laughs> okay, yeah. that, that's okay, we'll go to the foundation. Yeah. Right. That's okay, we'll go to, and all of yeah. a sudden, you know, we will get support when one part of the group said we don't support the organization. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that, you know, that there's alignment and you aren't supporting all these different organizations? Yes, yeah, so I think it goes back to this strategic alignment that we, mm -hmm. that we look at. Uh, what I'm looking for, and I, I'm trying to get my CMO to trade market so everybody that uses it has to pay me a royalty, uh, but what I'm looking for is the Clorox-ready talent. There's thousands, okay. hundreds of thousands of Latinos, but what I want are the people that understand our business, our industry, our geography, and what we're trying to accomplish. So an organization that can put me in front of, you know, I don't want a thousand people, but put me in front of the hundred people that know my business, that I can hire the ten people I want, that's value. When we look at this overall, uh, I think it's bringing back this, this business lens that I mentioned when mm -hmm. I first uh, started. So there's three components to that, you know, I, 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 and, I, and, I, and I describe them as such. You know, the diversity piece is having the right mix, so am I recruiting and retaining? That's my metrics, right? 
and then how, you know, making that mix work. So that's the inclusion part, and I'm, how am I developing, engaging, and keeping people? And the third piece would be you know, integrating with the business and connecting with the consumer. But a lot of times in this diversity space, it starts with affirmative action and getting the quotas and the people that we need. I kind of started differently. I started with the business, and the way I would uh, describe, if I, you don't remember anything else I said, remember this, is that I focus on how do I create pull from the senior executives that will bring us down in the direction that we're trying to accomplish versus push from more of a metric point of view. So all of the organizations, it's, I tell them it's very competitive. I don't have, you know, Clorox has a big heart, but we don't have a big wallet like my other folks on the <laughs> panel here. You know, we're only a five and a half. Matter of fact, we're so small that we still put a, we're in the Fortune 500, but we're like number 461, so we're in the bottom 10%, right? Uh, and we're so small that we still use a decimal point in our rev revenue. We say we're like 5.5 billion. Now who else puts a decimal point in revenue? Nobody else. But and, and all in, I'm 8,000 employees global. So we're like wow. small and nimble and scrappy. And you know, we get in there and we make sure. So yeah. I think it goes back to this part about uh, looking at all these organizations. I tell them I don't have more money, I have the same money. So you're competing for my dollars just as well as everyone else, just like the business does. And th these are the criteria I'm looking for, and if you can put that in front of me, then there's value and you'll get the, the, the thing. Yeah. And I think in all the executives, so the other thing that I did at Clorox, right, because when you get a new company, you have to learn the lingo and the culture. So uh, um, at Clorox, we love people who are different as long as they're doing it the Clorox yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so with that, you know, we, we have to look at those things and make sure that uh, we understand the culture and we can evolve it and get the right kind of people in front sure. of us. Right? And so when we have, so the one thing I listened to, when there's a term they use top to top. Now who else, you, Craft, you probably use this term top to top. Mm -hmm. So what does top to top mean? Okay, Ben O'Dor, you know, CEO of Clorox, meet with Doug McMillan, CEO of Walmart, top to top. Okay, good. So I use the same terminology. So if we're gonna meet with, you know, any organization, Alpha, whatever it would be, the CEO from that group, right, mm -hmm. come to Clorox and meet, the, the, if it's a finance thing, to meet the CFO. So when I have the meetings, it's not the HR talent acquisition people because they don't have any money, right? It's <laughs> going to be like the C-suite people, <laughs> right, and it's a top to top. And then it becomes, and then this, the CFO creates a pull for alpha versus talent acquisition doing a push for alpha. So I think that's key. We start there with the top to top because yep. that's the way the business runs and they like that term, so I use it as well. Or here, Lord. You know, you know yeah. I, I think I think what, what I would want the audience to to really understand is is that when we declared the fact that DNI, when companies said it's a business imperative, yeah. then I think the the game changed in the sense that we needed to manage, lead the organizations as a business, mm -hmm. right? And I think when Irby led um, with this conversation of ERGs as business units, mm -hmm. I think when you put that lens on the work that you do. You just elevated your value proposition, right, in the corporation. And, and one of the things around community, which I, I always find to be funny at times, but I think, you know, we get to a coming home to Jesus meeting kind of real quick, um, <laughs> is when organizations get really empowered, or ERGs or BRGs, and they say, oh, we're going to go work with this group. And with the company already has relationships that are already established, yep. mm -hmm. that you can eliminate a lot of the tension and a lot of the drama that takes place and actually build a stronger relationship when everyone is, you know, through a collective impact working with the same organizations that, have, that are on the pipeline, yeah. right? There is time to identify other organizations. There will always be time. But now you're, what you're hearing is this whole conversation around business, right? We're using terms like net present value yeah. and investments that in the past, I don't think we would have ever used, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I think it's exciting because just like pro, um, project management may have been in the military years ago, but when it was introduced in a corporate America and you saw just the trajectory change and quality and all the good stuff, I think we're gonna see the same thing when it gets into this discussion on employee engagement when we start leveraging people's differences mm -hmm. because we're having these conversations differently than we did in the past. Sure. And, I, and I think we need to feel comfortable in this space because it's a reality. Yeah. Lori, that, were you going to add yeah. to that? Mm -hmm. No, I think everything that we do, we have to put an enterprise lens on or we won't get any traction at all. Okay. And yeah. our organization very much you know, it's, it's, it's trying to change and become more collaborative, but very much kind of a siloed organization. So we're putting together what we're calling a traction team bringing business leaders together to evaluate our relationships and help us decide where our investment should go. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just about, so it's not just about talent acquisition. By the way, doing this 
<laughs> doing this, this uh, project, it would have been so much easier if we only said it was about talent acquisition, because mm -hmm. we could have gone in there and said, these are the right organizations. Yeah. But we had to say, we'd put the enterprise lens on and say, what are the organizations that are really, can be leveraged across the organization? And it wasn't just about the ones that, like an alpha, that we were leveraging heavily in HR. It was um, Easter Seals, as an example, that was being he leveraged heavily in the business. And we said, well, we don't have a relationship. HR doesn't have a relationship with Easter Seals, and should we have a relationship? Mm -hmm. But putting together this traction team is going to be very helpful, because now we're co collectively making decisions yeah on what the right organizations are and how much we should invest in them. That makes sense, that makes yeah. sense. Ken, I wanted to ask you a little bit, you know, the, there's always this um, term that I hear comes up a lot called the, you know, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, senior executives get it, but there's always the frozen middle, some folks will say, right? You know, some resistance from middle management and, and you know, I don't know, maybe with your background, some folks would think, well, you can just come in and you need to salute and execute and in incorporate this stuff. But, you know, within an organization, how do you, uh, you know, interact with those middle managers so that way they see that this diversity inclusion isn't a bolt on, it isn't added work, but it's part of what they, what they're as leaders supposed to be doing and supporting. No, no, great question. And it, you know, it's not just salute and execute. There's some push-ups involved with it as well. So, <laughs> um, no, I, I think that for the most part, a lot of times people just kind of bash the middle managers. Yeah. Okay, and I would tell you we have a lot of middle manager champions out there as well. So I've really tried to focus mm -hmm. my time on those people that are you know, doing it right, okay? And, and trying to highlight them in the organization and say, hey, this is the way it should be done. And I think try to get that competitive spirit going inside the organization mm -hmm. to say, hey, this person's being acknowledged for doing this good level of activity here. I can do that, you yeah. know, and get them more of a, a challenge with respect to, because I mean, a lot of times people will just kind of like take off a whole group and say, hey, the frozen middle, the middle yeah. managers, they're not involved in the effort. Matter of fact, they're the problem. Right, mm -hmm. so I think that you know what we try to do is to make sure that we just have a, you know, compelling, you know, coherent, consistent message that really does resonate from the top, but is something that can be carried by middle managers as well. And I think a lot of times you'll you'll end up not spending enough engagement with that particular group. Although I know everybody on this panel does, you know, you want to be able to just make sure that you find those people that are doing it right, that sure. get the message and get them engaged. And if you can do that, then it'll start to really pick Makes up traction. Lot. Makes a lot of sense. I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I'd love to open up to the audience. I, um, I, I wanted to add ahead. a little to that because one of the things we say at McDonald's is that diversity is everybody's business. Mm -hmm. It's not just the, the role or the job of right. our diversity mm -hmm. team to make it happen. And, and one of the things that have made us successful is making sure that people own it, leaders own it. Yeah. Mm. So we are not a part of HR. We report to JC Gonzalez, who's the president of RMHC, and mm -hmm. he has diversity. So HR is actually responsible for recruitment, for diversity recruitment, yeah. right? So when people come to us, we send them to HR. Yeah. Advertising, you know, it's part of the marketing department. Sure. Multicultural marketing falls in marketing. Franchising, diversity falls in franchising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And likewise, so we make sure that people own it throughout the organization, that it's ingrained as part of what they do. Yeah. And I mean, we haven't always been like this, but we've evolved over the years mm -hmm. so that everybody owns diversity. They are all sure. responsible for it. Yeah. So don't just come to our team for everything, yeah. because that's not how it works. Yeah. Like you said, Irby, we have no money yeah. like that either, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so we have to make sure that, you know, yeah. marketing has the bucks, so we, yeah. Yeah. we want, right. but we partner and we collaborate with all of those yeah. departments sure. to make it real. And, yeah. and let me build on that yeah. as well, right? And so I've been reading a lot of books on the psychology of what we control, you know, and I think it's critical because I think we lose sight of the fact that sometimes these strategies that are being created or permission given from up top, mm -hmm. you know, you'll, you could read anything about our companies and we are committed to diversity and inclusion, yep. okay, given. The issue is how do we execute on it? But I think Ken is spot on in the sense that if it's the strategies are top down sometimes, we have to acknowledge the fact that it's middle forward, right? And if it's gonna be middle forward, what are the tools, what are the things that we can provide and the insights that they control, right? We expect people to be ethical, 
right? We also expect people to be inclusive. So how do we get it in their psyche that that's a responsibility that they own? Because I think, you know, Pat, what you just said is, is, is so important, right? We want that person in a plant to be thinking about diversity and inclusion just as much as I'm thinking about it, yeah. right? Because guess what? I'm thinking about being ethical, mm -hmm. and I want them to be just as <coughs> right. ethical and inclusive like I'm being. And that's, I think that's the spirit yeah, we, that we're we trying to do. Yeah, we want them in our business. Yeah. Exactly. When it comes yeah. to diversity, we want everybody Everyone should be part of this, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. So I'll just add one thing, and I, I brought it, because I'm a visual person, so I brought our uh, annual report. You see it's very green. We talk about how green it is on the back, only 18 <laughs> pages. Everything else is electronic. <laughs> but when you look in here, right for the whole world to see, is our corporate strategy, right? And we talk about the business, be a top performing CPG company by being best at building big share brands and financially attractive mid-sized categories, that's nice. Strategy number one, engage our people as business owners. Strategic imperative, drive inclusion and diversity of experience, gender, ethnicity, and thought within our organization supplier base, right in the public document. The other thing I'm very proud of, we've heard a lot about uh, the Silicon Valley and mm -hmm. disclosing all their numbers. All of our diversity data is disclosed in the end report for all to see. Uh, I'm most proud uh, of that. Yeah. That's terrific. And, and it starts with the top, and so uh, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't have a, a million, 1.8 mm -hmm. million employees like McDonald's. We only have like 8,000 employees. But, uh, <laughs> but I will say this, though, is that uh, I'm very excited that our board of directors is one that I would hold up against any board of directors in the Fortune yeah. 500. Very diverse. Uh, for the mm -hmm. Fortune 500, board of directors, 12% minority, 16% women. Clorox's board of directors, 50% minority, 5-0, two blacks, two Latinos, one Asian, 30% women, an Asian woman, a black woman, a white woman. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, that's, not, that, that's not just window dressing. No. I mean, it, because it, it's driven by the CEO getting people with different points of view so we can be very competitive, yeah. and those different viewpoints help us be competitive. You know, Ken, to, to build on what Irby just said, you know, he, he showed the charts, right? And I, you know, for me, that reminds me of things like accountability and, and metrics, right? You know, how, wh what's that discussion like at, at GM with regards to, you know, how do you measure the success of your diversity initiatives and how do you hold folks accountable? Yeah, we, uh, you know, what did I hear at one of these panels here? I think it was last week, you know, we treasure what we measure, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that for us, it's, it's all aspects. So, I mean, I talked about a few items whether it was ethnic share or brand, where are we selling vehicles? It could be minority dealers. I think Steve talked about that yesterday as well. Women dealer, the supplier diversity piece. I mean, we were the first company to start the supplier diversity yeah. program. So, I mean, for us, we look at that from a standpoint of, you know, we've been part of the billion dollar round table from the beginning. So there's metrics on that. Tier one spend, tier mm -hmm. two spend, making sure that all that stuff comes back. And, and then there's also, there is the talent acquisition piece. I mean, I don't want to dismiss that. I know, and nobody was dismissing it on this panel. We all pay attention to it, but it doesn't derive every single action that we do, but we do want to track new hires. We sure. want to be able to understand where they're coming into the organization. We do want to make sure that we're not losing you know, people in certain parts of the organization at certain points in their career. We want to make sure that high potential pools are looking right, that we continue to have the Sense. flow all the way through. So all of those things from an accountability standpoint, there are going to be metrics. Every single one of the direct reports to Mary Barra, our, chair, our CEO, it has those metrics with respect to new hires and kind of executive potential pools in their documents that they're held accountable Makes for with respect to their bonus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yep. that's a big piece of it. But beyond that, I think it's just having a lot more exposure with the, our executive leadership team. So, and we had talked a little bit about mm -hmm. ERGs earlier. Yep. For us, it's been a big um, win for us to have each one of, we have 12 employee resource groups, but every single month that the ELT meets, we have one of the groups in there kind of mm -hmm. giving their pitch wow. as yep. to what they're mm -hmm. doing. And it is driven back to the business. There's a certain aspect with you know, community outreach where we want to make sure that each of the groups are doing that. But there's a talent acquisition, talent development. And then finally, what are you doing with respect to sales? You know, how are you connecting sure. with that constituency? Mm -hmm. How are you driving our business in those particular markets? So all of that ends up being their business plan that each one of the ERGs briefs. So we have kind of a drumbeat of mm -hmm. you know, varied messages across the board that spans kind of similar to what 
Pat was talking about mm -hmm. across yeah. the business functions. Yep. Every single element. It's not like I own all of them. I have a lot of dotted lines to people, but at the end of the day, procurement still owns supplier diversity. Mm -hmm. Our dealer networks still own minority dealer development. All that of that. Makes right. sense. So get your questions ready. I'm going to ask one more of, of, of Pat. Um, you know, when Marianne was introducing me, she mentioned that I'm a graduate of the Latino Leadership Institute at UCLA. And I remember when I was selected to go to that program, I, I, I don't know if I was too excited about it, right? At first, I'm like, the Latino le leadership, is this like the dumbed down version of le leadership development? Yeah, I wasn't too sure why we needed um, a leadership program that was affinity based. Now, of course, it's been one of the highlights of my career. I know you, you said now you have the Hispanic Leadership One, but Hispanic Leadership Two. Why do you think we need programs like that? Can't, can't those individuals go to the same leadership executive development programs as everybody else? Yeah, and, and they do. They, okay. they have the option to go to the same educational initiatives that's offered the training that yeah. everyone gets. But, you know, one of the things we've always felt that as, as people of color and as women, you know, when we come into these corporations, we don't. We weren't trained to know how to mix, how to make things happen for us when mm -hmm. we walk inside these big corporations. So when we created the career development workshops, specifically for people of color, black career, Hispanic mm -hmm. career, Asian career, now we have GLBT career development mm -hmm. and uh, women's career development. And, and those workshops, even today, help our employees navigate throughout the system. Because in many cases, our parents didn't work sure. in big corporations. Yeah. So what we do is we create this environment in our Hispanic career development, one and two, one for our restaurant managers, mm -hmm. two for uh, directors and managers in the corporation, just to create this environment so they have a, an opportunity to talk about things that affect them mm -hmm. as a Latino. Yeah. What can I expect? And, and the conversations that go on there, I think, have made a tremendous impact on the employees in helping them to be successful. Sure. You'll hear our senior leaders, our Hispanic leaders, will say, had it not been for Hispanic career development, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's mm -hmm. what gave them the foundation mm -hmm. to then go out and do all the other things that they needed to do in the organization, sure, sure. help I, to create yeah, that yeah. environment for them. Yeah, I remember in my yeah. program, we, we talked about things like isolation, right. uh, you know, power, uh, tokenism, you know, all these things, things right. that you don't always well, talk about. In those right, and we tell them, we say, leave your training manuals. We're mm -hmm. not going to yeah. yeah, teach yeah. you how to make fries today. Yeah. We're not going to mm -hmm. teach you how to make hamburgers today. Today, we're going to talk about you mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a Hispanic employee and what it means to be Latino within McDonald's Corporation, and we just opened the doors. Perfect. And and the and I got to tell you, the women, the career women's career development program for Latinas, I mean, it's just off the chart. And I, I want to recognize the person that developed that, Hilda Gonzalez. Would you Where's mind Hilda? standing? Because oh, sure. she created this for us. All right. Terrific. And. And we've gone to about seven different regions now. And like I said, we're going, we're going to Latin America, Hilda. Ray probably will be mad at me, mm -hmm. but you'll be headed to Latin America. But it's, yeah. just, <laughs> it's just wonderful when we can help people feel good about who they are. Yeah. Because if I don't feel good about who I am, I'm not going to give you my very best. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we help people feel good about who they are first. Yeah. Yeah. Jorge, we're going to add No, I was just going to build. I, I think the genius right, in that strategy, and congratulations, Hilda, for, for building that, is the fact that as CDOs, we're also looking at how do we bring 100% of you right, to the workplace? And if you have to cover right, being Latino, Latina, right, African American, if you have to cover, that means you're leaving a certain percentage of yourself at yeah, home when absolutely. you come in. Yeah. And we can no longer run companies where employees were not fully maximizing their capabilities. Exactly. Right? I think those days are gone, especially when you have uh, divestitures, when you have splits in companies. I mean, we need to make sure that you are engaged in order for us to be successful. And so like, I go back to the genius of that. Now we're talking about it as concepts of covering and uncovering. Yeah. But really, it's, it's getting into the conversation so I can bring more of myself to the workplace. That makes a lot of sense. Let's open it up for questions. So where are the mics? So, uh, OK, right here. Thank you. Brent Wilkes with League of United Latin American Citizens. 
My question is for Ms. Harris, and it's getting to the issue of making diversity decisions for the specific example. <coughs> You know, throughout the symposium and even at this panel, we've heard about the imperative of diversity and inclusion as being a business imperative for companies, and especially during challenging times or changing times for companies. At McDonald's, um, you've got a challenging situation right now. Your revenue's down about a third over last year. Um, you've got unions who are demanding higher wages, and you've even got health advocates out there who are pushing um, you on your menu saying that it's contributed to the childhood obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, so given all this cha challenging environment, why did you think it was a good business decision to terminate your director of Hispanic inclusion? And did you consider when you did that how that would impact your relationship with Hispanic organizations and Hispanic leaders? I appreciate the question, Brent, but I'm not in a position to answer any question about one employee, individual employee at McDonald's. I can continue to say to you that McDonald's is totally, totally committed to the Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. And I think we have shown evidence of that uh, and continue to show evidence of that based on what we have. I mean, you tell me one other corporation that has six Hispanic individuals at the table with the CEO every month talking about the business and talking about our Hispanic initiative. Um, but I'm very proud of the work that McDonald's does every day um, with Hispanic employees. Yep. If you talk to our Hispanic employees within McDonald's, they would tell you how proud they are to be a part of, of this organization. Things happen. That's all I can tell you. Things happen. And um, I'm, I'm not in a position, like I said, to talk about any one individual employee. But I can tell you that I'm totally elated, excited, and mm -hmm. We have a good team. We have a good team of people. Um, okay. Currently on my team, um, I report to Hispanic male sitting there and um, work with a number of Hispanics on my team. And, and I feel very good that we will continue to do the right thing uh, within the Hispanic community and to continue to build McDonald's and do the right thing. Good job, good job. All right, who's next? All right, over here, back here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Juan Takachel with ADP. Dr. Rodriguez, hey, good to see you again. You, Thanks for your previous work with us. Yeah. Uh, really a question for the entire panel, even though I think uh, George spoke somewhat to it. I was looking for the greatest success that your, your individual BRGs uh, have generated you know, under your leadership and, uh, and the support of the senior leadership in your organizations, whether they be uh, you know, new sales, new revenue creation, mm -hmm. uh, retention, or recruitment. Sure. Lori, why, why, you want to take that one? I think number one has been engagement, first thing. Okay. Uh, they have, we have the data that shows that our employees that are a part of ERGs are much more highly engaged than those that are not. And remember I was saying that we have work to do in our culture to make mm -hmm. it more inclusive and we're working on that. So having uh, any sort of, you know, the ERGs impacting engagement is huge for us from a retention perspective. I would say um, our LGBT, uh, ERG has done tremendous work leading the way in uh, you know, helping Mass Mutual become a leader in that space. We were number 10. By the way, we're on the top 10 for LGBT inclusion. We're 100% rated for HRC. Um, and we were heavily involved in the fight for marriage equality uh, as mm -hmm. an organization. So lots of those things. They help us look at looking at our marketing materials. They help us. Um, make sure that we're not doing the wrong things, mm -hmm. and sometimes we will you know, do the wrong things. So they've been very helpful. I don't know, Marcella, I want to say Marcella, <laughs> who heads our, she's uh, Marcella mm -hmm. Aldas Matos, who actually um, is in charge of oversight of all of our ERGs. Is there anything that you would add? Because they've done a lot of tremendous work, but we are on our evolution of yeah. moving our ERGs to become BRGs. Yeah. So we're making that transition right now. So I'll Is just, I'll, I'll, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, I was just gonna ask, was there one more thing that I should mention? I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I don't know if there's a mic. Sorry. <laughs> I got my team here, it's a little bit. No, it's all right, no worries. <laughs> They're in the reserve seats. Yeah, so. yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I think, uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, with Mass Mutual, my name is Marcela. Uh, we are uh, in this fantastic evolution we call that the journey of moving from ERGs to BERGs, BERGs mm -hmm. is how they call them. Uh, um, perhaps one of the more uh, critical aspects, it's uh, helping not just the ERGs and the groups understand the business value, measurable business value 
that the ERGs bring, but also working with the business mm -hmm. in terms of educating how they can leverage and maximize uh, that, that value. And that has provided just, just so much in terms of engagement, uh, recruitment and retention, and just in general, uh, helping understand how these communities, when they create a critical mass, uh, can also uh, bring, bring business value at just so many different dimensions. So, so sure. one more thing that I just remembered is our young professionals created a reverse mentoring program. Mm -hmm. um, we are now, and they're helping our business move into the millennial space. Terrific. So that's another, that's brand new, and we, we still don't know the results of that, but that's very exciting as well. Anybody else? Yeah, I can add, add to that. So I, I didn't, so a couple of things, I know, and I'll I know. try to stand pretty quickly. Uh, so looking at the business, I mentioned the acquisition of Nueva Casino. We also had a product launch, a, a, a brand called Clorox Fragancia, and that was based on research that uh, the Latino uh, household, uh, the Latino consumer spends, you know, three times as much time cleaning than the white consumer. In the kitchen, and the reason is uh, white, and this is the data, right? Uh, the data shows that a white consumer spends seven, eight minutes cleaning the kitchen, the Latina is spending 23 to 25 minutes. And the reason is, is that they're using three different products one for cleaning, one for disinfecting, a third for aromatizing. So at Clorox, we like to say that we own cleaning and disinfecting, we didn't have any aromatizing. So we launched this brand based on research, Clorox Fragancia. And it has a Z in it, and all of you Spanish speakers know there's no Z in Fragancia, but we did that intentionally so we could trademark it, right? So mm -hmm. we think about all that. The name, the, let, the employees came up with the name Fragancia, and it has, you know, the toilet bowl hangs, it has the, the dilutables and the aerosol. We did a three-year plan for that business, and we hit the three-year plan in one year. Mm. That's terrific. Terrific. Ken, were you going to add to that? <laughs> Real quick. I don't know if I have anything to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I've got more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll just bring out one thing directly yeah. tied to the business. Yeah. You know, and I'll go to our LGBT network. I mean, they did, uh, it was like $500 in creative for a Motor City Pride event. And you, some of you may have seen it. It was a Bolt ad that said, hi, mom. Hi, Dad. I'm electric, right? And so, anyway, it was uh, clever. It was a clever ad, and so anyway, it was just in a, a regular kind of local Motor City Pride event. But then it got onto the internet. It went viral. It ended up winning the GLAD Award for best, mm. you know, communique. So mm. this is something directly from one of our BRGs that was working on a little bit of creative, not a lot of money, but really started to impact the business and a lot of positive play amongst that community. So and there are many other examples. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, I think this is great that we see the forward thing. The ERG that really just did something that was remarkable, first of all, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in it, right? They were empowered. Um, so someone reached out um, to just get a translation, right? And you would think, oh, yeah, you know, the Latino gets a translation. Okay, got it. But here's what you got to think about, right? Um, that translation, the agency had it. The language didn't feel right, so someone said in marketing, why don't we give this to the employee resource group? They looked at it, and within, I would say, 40 minutes, crowdsourced it to over 1,200 Latinos at Crab. Mm -hmm. They came back and said, if you do this, this is what it's going to mean, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking what we gained from market share perspective, I look at it as what we prevented right. from yeah. creating noise in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so, so I'll transition to this, right? There's a, there's a cartoon that has just resonated for me that I, I want you guys to think about. And that's, there's a guy on his knees, right, looking, and the cop comes behind him. And you guys have probably seen it and says, what are you doing? So I'm looking for my keys, right? He goes, did you lose them? Yeah. Where'd you, did you lose them around here? And he says, no, I, left it, I lost it two blocks away. But why are you looking here? It's because this is where the light is, right? Mm. And, and I share that with you is because it's, <laughs> not, it's not what you look at that's important when we talk about diversity and inclusion. It's what you see, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I think we've gotten to the place where the metrics that we were looking at in the 70s and 80s, yeah. we've evolved, evolved this thing, and it's because of leaders <laughs> like you have right here next to me and that I've stole shamelessly from. And, and, and we're looking at employee engagement. We're looking at product launches. Yeah. I mean, Irby's doing this rope-a-dope and really you know, being humble about the great work that he's doing over at Clorox. But, it's because we're thinking about it as a business, yeah. right? And we're delivering on this thing. And I think that's the excitement that I get um, um, when we have this conversation. Sure. Absolutely. One, yeah. one of the things mm -hmm. I wanted to add, when we first started our employee networks, yeah. Hispanic network, 
black employee network um, back in the 70s mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. um, we have evolved. We, we started out as, you know, social groups and the women would have potlucks, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. <laughs> and, and so we've evolved. So about, I guess, six, seven years ago, we decided, you know, it's about the business, yep. finally. It's about the business. But the networks were important then because mm -hmm. bringing in new Hispanics, we had a welcome committee. We made everybody yeah. feel comfortable when they joined the organization and all of that. Today, we have 22 Hispanic yeah. networks around the country. Mm -hmm. um, we have them in, we have 22 regions, regions yeah. um, and they're in every region except Hawaii. We don't have a Hispanic network in Hawaii. Uh, but our corporate office, we have yeah. our Hispanic network. So we have 22 networks wow. today. And those networks are business networks. Mm -hmm. We tell them if it's not supporting the business, don't bring it to the table. Sure. I mean, it's nice, you can socialize with everybody, yeah. but if it's not supporting the business, we really can't support you. Yeah. And I can't go to JC and ask for any more money. Mm -hmm. So what's happening now, um, we've evolved to 2015, and for the first time this year, uh, our networks are having a unity summit, mm -hmm. where we're bringing all the networks together from all over the country, about 2,000 mm -hmm. employees are coming into Chicago, and we're having a unity summit where we will celebrate all of the networks together, mm -hmm. but we are allowing each of the networks to have an opportunity to have their half day. So the women yeah. will have a half day by themselves. We have a unity day all day where everyone will come together, our CEO and outside speakers, yeah. et cetera. And then on Thursday, each of the networks will have a half day and the last half day would be with the LGBT. So those women, African-Americans, mm -hmm. Hispanics, or Asian who are gay or lesbian can also attend that mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. So we're very proud that we have evolved to that point mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I think 10 years ago we weren't ready to have a unity summit, sure. but today we're very proud and, and we're hoping it'll work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and I'm uh, glad to see that evolution, right? Because it, Many companies, they were the food, flag, and fun folks, right? Yeah, but now that yeah. they've made that transition to become more yeah. business focused, we see more organizations allocating more resources for right, events like this. Exactly. Terrific. Question over here, or who's next? I don't know who's next. Okay, um, Sylvia. Yes, Sylvia Puente, the Latina Policy Forum in Chicago. Thank you for this panel. And my question is, how does what all of you do and this whole concept of diversity and inclusion change or not or um, evolve in the context of the fact that we now have several states in the, in the nation that are majority, quote unquote, people of color, that mm -hmm. in many of our states across mm -hmm. the nation, in Illinois, for example, we're at the tipping point where the majority of our children and students are children of color. Mm -hmm. So as, quote unquote, minority becomes majority, mm -hmm. what does it mean for how corporate America thinks about concepts, these concepts of diversity? diversity and inclusion, and what does it mean in five and 10 years out yeah. as these trends really mature? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with that and others can join in. So we're, we're very data driven, we look at that. We've been looking at the, the, I guess the census data for some time, if you go back to 1980 census, the country was 80-20, 80% 80 white, 20% minority, 12% black, 6% Latino, Asians, two, 3%. And you get to around 2000, and then a lot of companies got excited because the Latinos passed up blacks, 13% to 12. Mm. And the country's now about 60-40, and then we'll be uh, around 20-40, we will be majority minority is the term. California, where I'm from, is already majority minority. We're over 6%. This year, Latinos are going to pass up white as the largest population in California, 42% white, 40 then Asian, black is mm -hmm. smaller, uh, single digits. So when we think about that consumer, right, and that's the consumer lens, the business is how does that, do we have uh, the right representation? So we're trying to plan for the future at our company and make sure that we have the right representation of people, not just the kind of the percentages, but that can think that can help us grow with those different consumer groups. So what that means then is that uh, you also, also think of millennials, not so much as a generation, but also as another ethnic, as a kind of a culture, very different. You know, I'm the dad of a millennial, as an example, my son's at USC, kind of my mm -hmm. alma mater. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he thinks about the world very different than I do. And I think these, this work is going to evolve a little bit. He had an opportunity to go to uh, in high school to Singapore through a Stanford program. 
for six weeks, and he came back and discovered he wasn't the black kid, he was the American kid, right? Mm. Because yeah. his competition is the rest of the world, yeah. not just black and white in the US. So that actually transformed his way of thinking. So when we look at that, I I, it has to go back to, well, who can best help you understand those, uh, that population, and we need more people with different points of view uh, to, to accomplish that. Yep. So it, it's, it's critical. We're already, uh, I think, well along that path along this majority minority. Yeah. Lori, were you going to add to that? Yeah, so we're, you know, the, the demographics are changing. We know that. We're looking yep. a lot at the millennials. Um, it's changing our business model. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about business innovation. We've always been a direct uh, sort of like working through our agencies to sell our products. And for the first time, we're actually experimenting with um, online, you know, direct to consumer. We have uh, in Boston a, a storefront. We've never had a storefront before. Mm -hmm. And it's called Society of Grownups. And what that is, it's a place that's very welcoming to millennials. You come in, it's not about our selling you anything, it's about education. It's about you coming in and learning about, uh, maybe some of your challenges are around, uh, I have to pay off my, my student mm -hmm. debt. Um, or whatever the challenges might be for millennials. It's creating this safe space. So even the way that we do business is going to change fundamentally. Um, we're looking at, you know, digital. Digital is going to be a very big thing for us moving forward as well. And this is an insurance company, you know. And, and uh, I went out to Society of Grown Ups about a month ago. And, you know, think about insurance. Think about the people that sell you insurance. Mm -hmm. And I walk into Society of Grown Ups and very diverse, very young team of folks work there. Mm -hmm. And somebody pointed and said, there's our financial advisor. And she was in jeans, a sweatshirt, and a baseball cap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of this is going to change us. Mm -hmm. And if we're, you know, we're hoping that it's going to lead to you know, the next 160 years are going to be very different for Mass yeah. Mutual. And we've got to do things differently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sure. You know, mm -hmm. so what I was going to add was, um, is that the practice itself has been teaching this thing very uh, two-dimensional, right? So you'll have a schematic that shows uh, an iceberg, right? And above the waterline is what you see, and below the waterline is the various diversity dimensions. And one of the things, when we talk about how this has evolved, I, I, I've tried to now try to figure out a way, and, and the gift that my daughter gave me was her and her girlfriends were playing with the Rubik's Cube, right? And, and the argument has always been, well, corporate America is a white Rubik's Cube, right? There's just, it's just white. Okay, got it. And then so you had color, right? And you had different types of colors, right? Well, guess what, right? All the different dimensions change every time because as you as an individual, when you go into it, it clicks differently, right? If you can think about that, right? Um, when you ask the question, Sylvia, it's interesting because it depends on what paradigm we're building or what's gonna live five, 10 years from now. What would be the Latino, like how are Latinos gonna be defined if they're gonna be the majority now? Especially, there was a metric every second, there's someone that's turning in 18 years old or something yeah. like that, someone said. Um, we now have more Latinos who are capable to vote, right, if we, if we go down that path. But they're also, they're, diver they're not being defined as much as being Latino. So this ad that Ken talks about, mm -hmm. right, I made the biggest mistake one time. A gentleman was walking down the steps at Kraft, and I said, hey, are you going to the Latino Employee Resource Group meeting? Why would you say I would be going to that? I said, well, and this is one of those defining moments, because you're Latino, right? I, I, yeah. Right? And it's, I had to be transparent, right? Yeah. He goes, well, OK, I guess I am. He goes, but I'm gay. And I would go to the Craft Proud meeting before I would go to mm, sure. the Latino BRG meeting. Kind of like what you're talking about, giving them the space, right? Because we can no longer make right. those assumptions that people are being defined that way. Yeah. So if we carry that, right, continue to carry that, then let's continue to carry that we're humble people, that we don't want to move up, that we're happy where we're at because we're better than our parents. I, I think that we're evolving, right? Yeah. And so I think we are multidimensional, yep. and then that's what, you know, when Irby talks about yep. the marketplace and what the data that he's looking at, that's what we're understanding that we also have to change as well. So to define it today, it'd be difficult, but just if you can picture that Rubik's Cube moving, yeah. right, when you experience a difference, that's what I tell you that that's the challenge that we have around um, diversity and inclusion. Ken, were you going to build on that? I would just add, I think we've kind of covered what 
it means here in the U.S., but I would just want to add in the global perspective too. Okay, it continues to evolve on a global scale. And, you know, I have many discussions with all our operations around the globe, as I know Pat mm -hmm. talking about how much she travels around the globe. I would tell you how they look at DNI is a lot different in a lot of cases, okay? Sure. But there's a lot of common themes that, so it'll continue to evolve, sure. not just the demographic mix that's happening here in the U.S. I, I okay. neglected to say one and really important thing. We are launching a major Hispanic initiative, <laughs> and it's geared towards the millennials. It mm. really is. So that's, mm -hmm. that's how corporations are starting to change. Yeah. See the shift and change. Where's who's mm -hmm. next question over here? Hi, I want to thank you for your insights on on diversity. Uh, it's it's been a pleasure to to hear your thoughts on that. This question is for George. George, I wanted to echo on what you said about how do we execute diversity. Can you tell me how um, how your diversity policy is manifested in your in your organization at the executive level and the boardroom? Wow, I mean, there's like about four questions in that just question, right? But let me, let me share it, say it this way. Um, so diversity, let me define it as that's who we are. Inclusion is how we work together. What I found um, coming into craft that there was an appetite on how we could work better together. How do we deal with the differences? How do we create innovation at a faster rate than we were creating it? So when you ask, I would answer the first question is that there was just an urgency to have people collaborate better because we had also changed the footprint of the office. We eliminated all the offices, right? So our CEO sits on a steel case, kind of cool looking desk, right? It's like a table and um, they're open for everyone to see them, right? Um, our executive leadership team, they're also out there which is an interesting dynamic, an unintended consequence, right? When you create uh, an environment where you're in and out, you can no longer put pictures of your children, of your dog, right? Things that defined you, the tchotchkes that you've collected along the way. And what we realized was, wow, we were taking people's identities away from them, right? So I'm not even getting into representation yet, right? But I, I, what I want to impress on you is, is that this, we realized a lot of things that, Collaboration challenges you to think beyond just the skin color, right, or, or, or gender. Um, it, it forces you to think about how you work together, how you engage meetings, right? This is the classic conference call. Mm -hmm. If you're on voice over internet protocol, how many times does the call drop, right, when you're trying to go through it on, on, your, on your laptops? Because we don't even have phones. So now we're off our laptops doing things. And then if, you, if you're on your laptop, then you're sending it to your iPhone, your phone, yeah. now you have a different you know, connectivity issue. So those are the <laughs> kinds of things we explore. Then as we got into, um, we started looking at uh, females within our corporation, one of the things, and Bain did a wonderful study on this, because it, 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 it showed up so strong, we realized that the aspirations of women, somehow we didn't have enough intervention points to continue the aspirations that they had when they came on board the company. Yeah. So the data, it shows you that women actually aspire to be in the C-suite greater than men, right? Men just go in, hey, I'm gonna just check it out. After three years, if it works, you know, I'll stay. If it doesn't, I'll leave. Women are saying, I'm joining this company because I've done all this research. <laughs> Item 32, I'm still in it. I wanna work for this company. When they start getting into it, right, a lot of things happen. Mm -hmm. And the intervention points aren't the same. Maybe they don't go play golf, and I'll use that as the classic example. Yeah. Maybe they don't get invited to the lunch. Maybe they don't, and, and all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm not part of that, I'm not part of that, I'm not part of that, right? And so then we'll also realize that there's a confidence gap as well. And so that also helped manifest our strategies as well, right? And then, you know, I talked about 98% of the pantries in the United States, and this is a U.S. focus, right, have craft products. Um, we want to keep those products relevant. So we needed to make sure, you know, like Irby's doing over there, Clorox, right, um, that how do we keep our products relevant in the Latino, African American, because you just can't assume that the culture, to go back to Sylvia's question, is going to keep on our, um, our products the same way they did their generation or their parents did, right? You talk about millennials, mm -hmm. right? If it's the healthy thing, right? Companies have to adjust, yeah. right, for the demands of, of, of what's happening. But if I go back to the, the street light, 
if all you're doing is looking at gender and ethnicity and you miss the millennial thing and you're just talking about it now, yeah. there's companies that are way ahead of you on that. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at the street light looking for the keys right here, because this is where the light is, and the LGBT community was in the, over there, and you're just talking about it now, you've missed that as well. So yeah. I hope that answers your question, but that's how it manifests itself. You literally have to understand yep. how multidimensional we are. How much time we got? We got time for several more questions? Okay, back there. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not in the corporate sector. My name is Oreo Cardona from LULAC, New York, and um, I'm a community developer. I'm a local stakeholder, uh, and I think we are your market. And I have been involved in community development all of my professional life. So I know all the people, all of my mentors, all the champions that have built your markets. And we can't exist in this country without you. You're very important to us. You're as important to us as, as we are to you. So I asked this question perhaps of Mr. Rodriguez. Um, what happens when they get disparaged? What happens when they get abused? What happens when they need a voice and they don't have it? And those of us that have built Latino America, I'm talking about from the Bronx, California, um, Miami, all over, Chicago, Wisconsin, we're everywhere. And we've built communities, we know how to do that. We wanna be your voice, we wanna make sure that you're there for us, because without you, we have no access or no voice in corporate America. We heard, that um, McDonald's had five big players on the table <laughs> with the CEO, but when the African-American CEO had to leave, they didn't look at the five Latinos. They looked at a wasp from England. How can we get involved and help some of that? We heard that there are issues with middle management when some of the people get mm -hmm. rift through reorganizations. They're usually Latinos. How can we help that? We on the field, we on the ground, your markets that you bring your brand to want to defend you because we need you. Yeah, so the question is? The question is how do we help? How do we help? Without, what, without burning our bridges to you. Yeah. Well, you, know, you know, if, if you don't mind, you know, kind of, when, when I look at this issue, I think it's a both and approach, right? You know, a lot of the discussion we, we talked about yesterday in the panel about preparing the workforce and, and there was a lot of um, dialogue within the Latino community that, hey, you know, we need to you know, get more education, we need to get these skills, we need to be flexible. Um, and there's a lot that we, of course, need to do within ourselves, within our community, within our families. <coughs> uh, but what I love about all these organizations up here is that um, they're also creating an environment where they are nurturing the success of everybody, right? Not just the, the Latinos, but um, they're making sure that everyone can bring their whole selves to work. They're making sure that everyone has a, a level playing field. And I think that's how we solve it. So there's things that we can do within our community, but I love the fact that organizations are doing their part. So that way it's not a matter of, because trust me, I get some calls where companies, the implied message is, Robert, come on in and fix those Latinos, would you? Because mm -hmm. they're not assertive enough, not aggressive enough, they're not this, and I'm like, I ain't fixing anybody, right? I'll help you, Mr. and Ms. Employer, create the conditions that nurture their success. And I think that's how we'll solve it, kind of a bull fan approach. Yes? Or I don't know, who, who has the mic? Okay, over here, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Pablo Toro. I work for Intel Corporation. Uh, I am the president of the Intel Latino Network in Oregon. Uh, that's one of our major sites. Uh, it's amazing to see where you are today. You represent a lot of what a lot of us want to be probably at some point in our careers. You have gone through all the hoops. You, you've done it, right? Uh, when we look at, uh, at the ERGs, when we look at that pipeline. You look at these future leaders, right? They're already, you know, leading big organizations, volunteer organizations, some of them providing a lot of value. Um, can you give me a few examples of how are you working on your, on your, um... oh man, I, where did I put it? Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be your succession plan for these leaders to be where you are, right? And if you are, um, working on somebody at this point, can you give an example of how that looks like? How are you helping them get there? Yeah. It's a sponsorship, it's, it's uh, you know, helping them along, but I would like to see some examples of how you're you know, pulling. Can we get people. one example and then we'll uh, start wrapping up? Anyone want to take a stand with it? I, I can take it. So if you're talking about, I think part of it is this access to the C-suite. 
So our, uh, most organizations, we have something that's called the People and Culture Team. It's run by the uh, EVP of HR, but in that meeting is the CEO and all the top executives. They meet six times a year. Right? And then diversity is always the standing agenda item. And uh, I know how meetings go, so I'm always like first on the agenda, because I don't want to get cut short and I don't want to get bumped. <laughs> so I'm always on the agenda, first. All right. Smart guy. <laughs> but, part, but part of what I do is, you know, and, and I like to talk, and you, and you heard me talk a little bit, but even I get tired of hearing myself talk. So what I do is I bring, no one asked me to do this, but I decided to do this, I bring an ERG with each time. You know, and I heard you said you do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So I bring an A, but not VPs and directors, I bring management level, mm -hmm. right? So they're getting, because if you're the CEO, the information you get has been filtered 10 times, right? And so the, it's, it's not a training, in a sense we're trying to give the executives a personal experience with the future leaders. So I, I make all the people to present with me do an, a bio. Do an ex see the CEO's bio? Do a bio just like that. Don't give me your Facebook photo. I'm going to have, you know, we're going to go to creative yeah, service. Yeah. We're going to take a professional photo. And we send that as a pre-read. And then when they get in there, they talk about what the ERG is doing. They might talk about something they're doing external with Alpha yeah. as an example. But the one thing everybody does, and I bring two people, they, they, they talk about these three things. They have one slide, and the slide says, what attracted me to Clorox, what's kept me here, what I need from the executives. And the executives tell me that's the best part of the whole day. They meet all day, and I've got like the first hour. But they get direct access to the employees, and the employees get direct access to the C-suite. Their confidence goes up. And not only the one person that goes there, but all the other people in the community said, wow, you know, Robert went there, and he was talking to the CEO mm -hmm. directly in the morning. So I think that access helps. And, you know, of course, you have to coach yeah. and develop them. They don't just kind of show up there. But uh, I think that's the key part is that ha that's a cadence that happens all the time. Yeah. So I want to wrap this up by giving each panel an opportunity for one last word of wisdom, bit mm -hmm. of advice based on your role with, uh, within diversity within your organization. Pat, if, mm -hmm. if you can, any kind of nugget of wisdom? Sure. What, what I would say is that diversity and inclusion is an evolution. It's a journey. There's no destination. It's a journey. We will continue to work on this year after year mm -hmm. after year mm -hmm. because there's no stopping point. Things change every day yep. in this world within our organizations. And as diversity practitioners, I would just challenge all of us to be open, honest, and candid with the leaders, with mm -hmm. the leadership, but also with the people that work with us. Sure. And, and allow them to bring their whole selves to work mm -hmm. so that they can give their best. I like to say we want to create an environment where everyone feels valued and appreciated on both sides of the counter. Like so that. whether you're <laughs> working for McDonald's mm -hmm. or whether you are customers walking into our restaurants. Makes sense. Perfect. Lori? I think uh, just to kind of take what you said around um, I'm thinking about being effective in the role of the diversity leader. Um, I have a mentor that brought me into the field in 1989, so that's a long time ago, and every time I take on a new job, he always calls me and says, I want to remind you, don't get too attached to the title, don't get too attached to the money, because if you do, you will cease to be effective in your role is you have to be willing to have the courage to say what needs to be said and be the mirror that you're holding up uh, for your organizations to get better. And I always remember those words. Every time it gets a little scary, <laughs> you know, it's rem reminding myself why I'm here. And I also, um, to the gentleman that asked the question before, I actually was thinking of that question more personally around what I'm doing to create a legacy in the organization and make sure that I have people ready to pick up the baton when I move on. Uh, I plan to be in corporate America maybe five more years at the most, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I surround myself with really smart people, mm -hmm. and I invest in their development, and I'm constantly you know, bringing them to the table. You saw me doing that here. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, have an opportunity to get up and speak. And, and uh, uh, so I think that's important, too, because oftentimes we leave, because I've left two organizations mm -hmm. before coming to Mass Mutual, and then you don't, you, you don't have the solid foundation that, it, that people can keep it going. Sure. So I think that's really something that I've learned in my okay. career. Mm -hmm. Jorge, we're almost out of time, maybe yeah, 10 so, seconds so each. So, be, so I was also <laughs> thinking about that question. Yeah. So if you don't see the diversity up top that you want to see, become the leader you don't see. Mm -hmm. Because inevitably, the leaders that are looking for that diversity mm -hmm. will spot you, right? And and like I said, I was re I've been reading a lot of things uh, in the psychology about what we control. Use the tools that are being used in the organization 
and learn them well because when you step into a role, your, your training and your development almost assumes that you should know how to do it. So when you talked about the pipeline, right? It's a question for us, so thank you. But at the same time, why don't you drop the talent management processes that exist in your company so that someone can see you managing a talent pipeline in the organization, especially if that's not your role, right? What, you know, because one of the things that I think it's important, for those of you that lead BRGs and manage mm -hmm. 800 people, there are business units that aren't that big. Yeah. But guess what? You're leading a team that that's that big. How cool would it be if your leaders saw you and recognized you for that? Sure. Ken, real quick. All right. Yeah, so I, I would say back to Pat's point, you know, it's, um, it's progress, it's not, it's not overnight, it's over time, okay? So just really focus on that aspect, and I'm going to quote a guy, because I'm sure he's trademarked, it is Ted Childs, who I work hey. with a lot. Mm -hmm. um, he says, you know, a lot that uh, diversity is the picture, inclusion is the test. So just take that thought. And, uh, Makes sense. Okay. Makes sense. Good. So I'll... I'll want you to think about this. The past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. Mm -hmm. So I'm about creating the future. And that means going from hindsight to insight to foresight. Terrific. What a way to end the panel. I will give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if we can just stay here, we'll let uh, Sid kind of Great. Um, another big round of applause for our Chief Diversity Officer Roundtable, Dr. Job. Robert Rodriguez, Irby Foster of Clorox, Kim Barrett of General Motors, Jorge Quesada of Kraft, Lori Valles Yanez of Mass Neutral, and Pat Harris of McDonald's. A big round of applause All for right. them. Good job. Good job.